Hello, I'm Avin Jogia. And I'm Erin Westbrook. Welcome to RealWorks. When filmmaker Kidder Joseph looked at the changes in his bed sty neighborhood, he saw the complex and often troubling impact of gentrification. Beyond the new buildings, cleaner streets, and fancy new shops, something was clearly being lost. A community. Here's the award-winning documentary, Clapping for the Wrong Reasons. All right, let's start it. I'm starting? Yeah. All right. So, I guess, can you say your name and what you do? Hi, my name's John. I, I do a lot of building and design, uh, interior work, uh, businesses, residential, that kind of thing. Mostly Finnish uh, carpentry. And uh, right now we're in Bedvine Brew. Yeah, Michael's store, next to his wine shop. And uh, I really like what they're doing. I mean, We've done a lot of this kind of work. We've had to do it in Manhattan, mostly. Yeah. Uh, now you've got people like Michael who are putting businesses in the neighborhood. You know, I come from Manhattan and now I'm here and I'm setting up commerce and business, but what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to help, you know, uplift the community by keeping the money in the community. When I moved here, um, I found myself always going out of the neighborhood. So the neighborhood was definitely lacking of services or good places for people to go to eat or even a good bakery, which is what, you know, I hope I brought into the neighborhood. The neighborhood was definitely lacking of a lot of things. So that played um, a factor in me um, opening up here. Yeah, there are more amenities. There's wine shops, there's cupcake shops like next door. There's um, groceries and you know, that weren't available before. I started seeing more patrols in the neighborhood. I started seeing um, the streets were being repaved. Um, and this is as um, the different groups started to move into the neighborhood. You know, um, I started to see these things take place. And I thought it was very interesting in that um, we have been asking for that um, for quite some time and we never saw it. And then all of a sudden, you know, it's this big explosion of buildings and, you know, the zoning laws change where you can build above a certain amount of floors, uh, the rezoning of Bedford-Stuyvesant, the renaming of Bedford-Stuyvesant. So, I mean, it's, it's very interesting to see how all those things are coming, coming about and it's almost like we don't, like, have a say in our own neighborhood. So, do you think gentrification is a good thing or a bad thing? It depends, you know, I mean, I, I think it can be good, it's both. Yeah. Right? I think it's both. Uh, depends on what point of view you want to take. Uh, gentrification can, uh, you can look at it as people starting to take pride in their, uh, in their property or where they live, in their community, in their neighborhood. Uh, they don't necessarily have to be people who are just moving in. They could be people who have been here for many years. You know, the gentrification, you know, it gets a negative connotation because sometimes when an area up, um, you know, uplifts itself, you know, economically, certain people get pushed out. Yeah. That's just, that just happens. I mean, I've been pushed out, you know, I, I lived in, you know, Manhattan. It's too expensive for me. I got pushed out of there. Yeah. Now, you know, because it was too expensive, I'm in Bed-Stuy now. And, you know, basically, you know, people can consider me a gentrifier. Yeah. Basically, because, you know, I come from Manhattan and now I'm here and I'm setting up commerce and business. But what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to help, you know, uplift the community by keeping the money in the community and not letting it be siphoned off into different areas. What's your name? William Rick. William. Unfortunately, I think when gentrification is to take place in the neighborhood, honestly, I think it's my opinion, the current inhabitants are the last to know. They're the last to know. They just wake up one day, oh, one new neighbor. The next day, another new neighbor. 
a month passed, another new neighbor. Yeah. Next thing you know, it's just a whole bunch of neighbors, new neighbors, and you. Yeah. I do think it's sad in lots of ways that to see uh, lots of homes that were once owned by black people now being owned by people of a different color. It's a right on doesn't they matter which charity it is. So why only give to the ones that's benefiting in the, in the suburb? They don't. Yo, yo, they look don't. at real estate. Look at real estate downtown Brooklyn. Who do you think they building that for? Not for no, us. I. Yo, yo, look, 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 right here in Best Style. Who do you think they building Best Style for? for Alright, listen, get us out of here. There's really no communication much. You know, people would see each other. And um, many times if they're not walking their dogs or looking down, not making eye contact, there's really not much of a community feel or any sort of contact that's been held at a certain level. So it could always try to be fair. It could maybe not only be my perception of them, but maybe what are their perception of us. Some of them act as if like they've always lived here. And yeah. two, like they're entitled or they should be, or they should, you know, be here. and. Really, I don't know if there's much remorse on their part as far as the fact that that really nice apartment that, that they're now living in, yeah. and maybe at one point there was a, a four or five person family living in, that, living, living in that same apartment. Because you have certain people over here that grew up over here for life. Yeah. They were born over here, raised over here. We got like people like Miss Barbara, I don't know if you know her. She's about 60, 70 years old. Yeah. You know, she been on this block man, longer than I've been alive. And, you know, people like her may be forced out. So for instance, they're coming from Manhattan, they're priced out. Well, let me move somewhere. I'm, I, I actually don't want to acknowledge that I'm moving someone else out that's lived here for maybe generations. Yeah. Because I need this space now, because I'm priced out of this other neighborhood. Yeah. But let me rephrase it with, I'm going to make this neighborhood better. Better than what? So you have to look at what, what are they referring to when they say better. That's a code word for something, I think. I cut a white man here, right in his chair, I cut his hair. He's like, yeah, um, real estate is going crazy up here. You know, I, I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, you from right here? He's like, yeah, I just moved around here, man. Like, he said, I got a uh, one bedroom right here on Tompkins between Hancock and Jefferson. Right now here. He said, I said, yeah, how much the rent is over there? He said, I'll pay 2,500. One, one bedroom. bedroom. Yeah, one bedroom. One bedroom. And they paying that. One black man. Which one of y'all in here gonna pay twenty five hundred for one bedroom right now? None here? of us. None, ah. of us. Yeah. None of us. Point man. I think there are homeowners, property uh, owners, who are selectively saying, "No, I want this clientele here. Yeah. That's what I'm comfortable with. That's what I want here, and that's it." Yeah. And do you feel like so? But that's that's also part of the gentrification. A lot of people in color, you know, decide they want to give up their homes, you know, uh, you know, uh, to these people who are driving by and offering you cash for your homes. Who come in, they see that uh, the real estate's gaining value in this neighborhood, and obviously there's a lot of beautiful buildings. They come in and they, they manipulate a way to take advantage of someone who possibly uh, doesn't know the value yet. Of, of what they have and they, they rest it away from them and then they turn around and just sell it for a quick buck. I'm not going to let somebody tell me that when people use us and do predatory yeah. lending and take advantage of us, that they're not responsible okay. hold, hold, for hold up, hold the up. condition. Now I understand what you're saying, but you gotta, excuse me, you gotta change your language. We have to become responsible for our own condition. Thank you. We have to become responsible for our own success. Thank you. If we all decided, hey, go to college, even if we didn't go to college, we all decided to say, you know, let's get a really good job. Let's do something. Let's invest money instead of just spending it on nothing. Let's invest back into our neighborhood. It, it, would, it would have been possible for that to happen, but that didn't. You know, people have to, to gather information for themselves and decide uh, if this is bad or this is good. I, I don't think there's a blanket statement to, yeah. to cover the topic. I, I think it's really case to case.
you know, and I'm listening to your question, uh, maybe I need to do some sort of research of what life was like before. And maybe even you, you know, doing this project, what life was like before, the amount of black businesses, the amount of money that came into this neighborhood, what type of businesses existed, why did businesses, you know, go down within the neighborhood, what were some of the factors that, uh, that could be attributed uh, to it. We can't worry about what society is doing. They don't even have money. What we got to worry about is what we got. If, if I own a building and I see that the gentrification is coming through, I'm not selling. I love being over here. So in order for me to stay over here, if I have to make more money, then that's what I have to do. Nobody's going to push me out. You can try. I may be weak now. You probably get me a little nudge. I may have to move for a little bit, but then I'm going to come right back. So I don't see it as a big deal. People always want to work for something. Matter of fact, not even work for something. They claim they want to do something, but they're not willing to work for it. And I feel that's the hard part. That's what we're hard. Uh, I'll be that Bethel Stavis and Capital Potentate. Humble and talented, let my action prove that I'm great. Kind of so, the hip hop you adore. Now bring it back, back. But lyricism lives forever. And I'm time to start a revolution. I feel the evolution. Let's stop all the pollution. If you that was clapping for the wrong reasons. I'm here with Roshana Paul, uh, and what do you think that your experience has been with RealWorks, with the, the people and the environment? Well, my experience with RealWorks is rewarding because, well, I came in here, I made my own documentary, and then I started working for RealWorks. I went to Washington, D.C. with RealWorks. Cool. What did you do in D.C.? A couple of students. We went, we screened our films. Oh, well, cool and met other filmmakers and other organizations. When you made your documentary with RealWorks, how cool was that to be able to like get cameras and like shoot something and have like a professional people here to mentor you and help you? I mean, like how, how was that? Well, I had no experience coming into RealWorks and then RealWorks just taught me everything. It taught me how to use Final Cut Pro, how to hold a camera, how to use a camera, and I just learned a lot, everything I know about films from RealWorks. Do you like it? Do you like making films? I realized I like making films through RealWorks because I never knew. Yeah. And after I realized I'm actually good at it and I like to edit. What, what about the editing process do you like? Well, when it comes to editing, that's where the story really begins for me because mm -hmm. you can create a story. Editing is where you really put it together and right. you're in control. Yeah, you gotta make it all happen right there. Yeah. And it's, it, there's subtleties to editing and you can actually really tell a story. You can make or break a story, I think, with editing. It's really cool. Obviously, when you did working with RealWorks, you, you found out that you really like to edit. You felt like you, you know, kind of found what your, your like a niche thing is in this. What, what, do you, what do you think that, do you think that that's something that RealWorks does, is make kids find out like what, like what they like about this job? Well, RealWorks kind of like guides you through the way. Mm -hmm. It teaches you every aspect of film so that you can know what exactly you, like your strengths and your weaknesses. Mm -hmm. So RealWorks does kind of shape and mold you when it comes to the filmmaking world. So with RealWorks, um, what about the community? Do you think it's nice to have like other people who are around your age with similar experience or lack of experience to make films together? Do you guys collaborate or how does that work? Yeah, um, there are certain labs like Summer Lab where there's a lot of collaborations within the students and you make your own documentary or in narrative films mm -hmm. and it's really It's fun. really cool. Yeah. Awesome. So I hear that RealWorks has made its first feature film, uh, 72 Hours of Brooklyn Love Story. You want to tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, um, we had an improv instructor and she taught us basically how to act and how to improv. And mm -hmm. we played games and we learned serious it's things. It's kind of fun, and, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it was, it was different. Yeah. It was new. I actually got a chance to act because um, the director, Ra Rafi Rivera, yeah. he came and he actually wrote the script from looking at the improv class. Cool. Yeah, I mean, what an experience to be able to like watch a film get made in all the stages. Like, the f go from a short film to, to and all that improv to write the script, and that's a really cool way to make films. I think yeah. that's a. Do, I mean, did you really enjoy the experience? Yeah. It's really cool. Did you get a chance? I mean, I guess through all the improv, you kind of got a chance to like make who your character is and and really like. We created some of the characters. Yeah, it's crazy. And then your words are right there on the on the screen. That's cool. That's awesome. Filmmaker Luckney Jacques was fascinated with street performers and subway dancers. But when he turned his camera on two remarkable young dancers, he saw himself reflected in their struggles and dreams of making it out of the neighborhood for a better life. He discovered it's more than just dancing.
when I'm on the train station, I see a lot of a lot of dancers. I think to myself, like, why they dancing in the train for asking for money? Why they can have like a job? I feel like we're the same people. Like I feel they they pain and if they, they probably feel my pain too. I started dancing really when I was a baby, like the age of two. But when I really started getting into the the real life of dancing and really just focused to it, I was ten. Some people have these skills, like they skills is moving their hands, moving their feet. And my skills is probably working with my hands, like working with camera. Most of us probably not good at school works and stuff like that. So we struggle with that because we have to worry about both things. So I think that's, that's why it's, it's, I'm interested in getting to know about the dancers to see if they, like, they have the same problem that I have. I tried, but it's like when I try, I never go nowhere. I have dreams, but it's like school will affect my dreams. The thing's gonna get harder for me my senior year, and I feel like it's gonna get harder and harder, and it's the more pressure I'm gonna have on me, the more my head is going to start hurting, it's going to make me want to give up. And I don't want to be those kids that dropped out of high school. I started when I was six. And from there, it just picked up. When I was telling my parents I wanted to be a dancer, they, they expected it because when I was younger, what I would do is dance. I'd be in the living room playing the radio just dancing. And I wouldn't really care what was on as long as there was a beat I was dancing to it. Being a, a, a famous dancer or an entertainer is hard while, while you're in school because you got to think about school and your your life job at the same th at the same time. I don't worry about money. I worry about my the opinion of my crowd. If I can't do what I do the right way, then I can't make money off of it. So the money is not important. When I'm performing on stage, I do get I do get checks in. Yeah, it's it's good. But on on the side, every once in a while, I'm not really looking for the money. I'm just trying to enjoy myself right now. A lot of people bring attention to us, and some of us worry about what other people think about us. If people tell us we're not good, we're going to think we're not good. So, yeah, I think that's what the struggle is, and we listen to people too much than ourselves. The feedback that I get, it inspires others to do, to, to go to accomplish their dreams and go after what they believe in, and to try to dance themselves and go on and try to be positive about what they do and just be confident in it, not, to know not to give up. Keep your hopes up and your head up and just live out your dreams and everything is just gonna come to you. People talk about me, make me feel like I wanna give up sometimes, but I know I can't let them get in my head. They're the people that's trying to knock me down. 
Und dann bist du am Fuss schon als der. <lacht> Have you ever had that nightmare? And when you awoke, you couldn't determine whether you're still asleep or if you're awake. You can't determine if the dream is real or was it fake. My nightmares aren't like that. When I awake, I know that when I open my eyes, the dream, the nightmare, it will never end. Because my nightmares are both in my dreams and in real life. I'm from Brownsville, Brooklyn, but before I continue, I feel like I gotta ask this question. Who here felt a little bad when they heard I'm from Brownsville? <laughs> yeah, who felt a little sorrow and pity for me? <laughs> don't worry, you don't need to raise your hands, just accept that I'm about to prove you wrong. Do me a favor, before I keep going, whatever pity you have, don't give it to me. I don't need it and I don't want it. When I have my nightmares, I got the courage to get out of bed in the morning and brush them off to the side. See, growing up, I had a stepdad who didn't believe in giving me pity because he thought I didn't need it. He thought I was too strong for it. So him and my mom told me something that would stick with me. That in this world, you need to fight for what you want in life. Because nobody, no matter how much pity they give you, is going to give it to you. So I fought. I've been fighting since I was a kid and I'll be fighting now. See, living in Brownsville didn't make me what everybody expected me to be. Don't believe me? <laughs> Go ask my teachers. Maybe, yeah, I don't have the highest grades in school. But if you ask them, I'm nothing like the rest. The Brownsville I live in, the hellhole that is my own made me who I am. They made me the man I am today. Okay, so maybe I have to spell it out for some of you. This right here, this is not a confessional statement. This is an identification statement like my sis Dylan. This is, an, this is a protest like my bro Javon. I have a seven-year-old little brother. <laughs> and he doesn't think like that. See, when my seven-year-old little brother meets somebody, he doesn't care about the clothes. He don't care about the color of their skin. For him, it's like he closed his eyes and he just says, who are you? So if a seven-year-old can do it, why can't you? Now here's what I want you to do. Shut your mouth, shut your eyes, and open your ears and ask a person, who are you? My name is Ja'Kai Anthony Sidbury. Nice to meet you. My friends, they call me Ka.
Well, that's it for today's show. Thank you for joining us. See you next time on RealWorks.